All right. Any other requests for uh, stoichiometry review? I have another stoichiometry review on here. Um, your for the next, so we don't have class on Monday, right? So Tuesday, you're going to have another uh, paper assignment with Tom's. Um, and it's going to be more practice with stoichiometry. I really want everybody to get comfortable with stoichiometry. I know that we not everybody got there before the test, but hopefully before the next test, it should feel really, really straightforward, even if it takes a lot of practice. So we want to do another one of these as a word problem right now, or we want to get to some new stuff. Let's do this one. Let's do this one. I had this on the on the docket, and I think it's good practice for what we're going to do to write out the reaction yourself. So this is a, another real world example. Computer chips, including the ones in your phones, um, are manufactured from silicon, which occurs in nature as silicon dioxide. Anybody know what silicon dioxide is? Sand, glass. Yeah, if you take silicon dioxide and you heat it up to melting and it reacts with solid carbon. So basically you just take coal and liquid glass and you mix them together, you can make silicon as a liquid and carbon monoxide gas. So let's start by writing out that reaction, including the phases. So silicon dioxide. It's heated to melting. So we're gonna start with liquid, liquid silicon dioxide reacting with solid carbon to form liquid silicon and carbon monoxide gas. Start by writing out that reaction and balancing it. Yeah. Just see. Technically, we should have more information as to is it in the form of graphite or is it in the form of diamond? But it doesn't really matter for the sake of this as far as balancing. Yeah. So silicon dioxide. Straightforward, right? Nice thing about those covalent, that covalent nomenclature. Silicon dioxide as a liquid plus carbon as a solid. And to Aria's question, or carbon is not one of those diatomic elements. So when we just say carbon, it's just C. If I said nitrogen, it would be N2. Or if I said oxygen, it would be O2, right? We talked about those. Carbon, but it's basically just the things that are gas at room temperature. Um, and uh, column 17. So hydrogen, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and then column 17. Then it reacts together to form liquid silicon. So SI, still liquid, and carbon monoxide as a gas. So now that we know our nomenclature really well, writing out the reactions is pretty straightforward, right? You just look at the description, turn it into formulas, and write it out. How do we balance it? There's two oxygens here and only one over there, so we need to put a two. Which means we need to put a two in front of the carbon, too. Good. So it's balanced. We have starting amounts of silicon dioxide and carbon. So we can go ahead and write those where, where we normally would see them, right? We say 155.8 kilograms and 78.3 
or kilograms. We're balanced, we have amounts, so we do what? Put them all in moles. And I guess just to be consistent, we could also write our, our um, it produces 66.1 kilograms. That's our actual yield. So if we take all these amounts, turn them into, into moles. Um, this is also worth noting, this is just one part of the silicon production in order to, to make computer chips or solar cells out of silicon. What types of silicon do you need? Anybody know? It has, to be, it has to be crystalline silicon. So not only a solid, it has to be a very, very perfect crystal with no flaws. Um, which, and so silicon production for semiconductors is actually a really, really big part of global trade right now. Uh, because there's only a few countries in the world that actually produ mass produce crystal and silicon for semiconductors. It's the US and China and, and uh, Taiwan and, and Hong Kong are some of the only places that mass produce silicon on the scale that, that modern world requires for smartphones and laptops and servers and things like that. Not to mention solar cells. All right. So how are we going to get these two moles? One kilograms, not grams, but that's no that shouldn't stop us, right? So we're going to use the molecular weight, 155.8 kilograms. One kilogram. Thousand grams. There's silicon dioxide, add your pieces together, right? Silicon is 28.8. Is that what I'm seeing over there? 8.085. There we go. Plus two times 15.999. So I get 60.08 grams is one mold SiO2, right? So it's just our standard molecular weight calculations. We just have to put it, go from kilograms to grams first. No big deal, right? One fifty-five point eight times a thousand over 60.08, I get a right around 2,600. So how many sig figs are we going to keep here? Four. So that's nice. I don't have to use scientific notation. Two, five, nine, three. This is what I got here. And seven eight three over I get six thousand five hundred and nineteen moles for the carbon. We only get to keep three sig figs, right? So six five six point five two ten to the three moles. And then we might as well do this one too, right? So six, six, one. What is it? Point oh eight. And I get twenty-three fifty-four over here. I just take in each of these, multiply by a thousand, divide by the molecular weight. It's a lot of moles. I'll think about what, how much is a kilogram? 
kilograms about two pounds, right? A lot. a lot in terms of moles kilogram is a lot yeah so if we're talking about 78 kilograms of carbon that's about 150 pounds 150 pounds of carbon is kind of a lot you know picture that's think about a bag of charcoal that's the right density right how many bags of charcoal a bag of charcoal is probably about 30 pounds. So we're talking about five bags of charcoal that you would use for your barbecue, about that much carbon roughly. So it is a lot of moles. How do we figure out what's gonna run out first? Can we can we eyeball it to get an idea? It won't answer our final questions, but why? Six divided by two is keyboard is getting really rough, right? Go ahead. Right. So even though we're using up the carbon twice as fast, we have more than twice as much. So that tells us we can be pretty certain that the silicon is going to run out first. We still want to show our work for that, especially since the question is asking us for the excess reactant. We're going to have to do the work anyway, but that at least tells us what we should start with. We're pretty sure this is our limiting reactant. So we can say, okay, well, 2593 moles of SiO2, and every one mole SiO2 is two moles carbon used. So, 5,186. Everybody with me on that one? So we're most of the way to being able to, so does that prove that we got the right limiting reactant? Why? Yeah, this is how, if we use up all of our silicon dioxide, this is how much carbon would be used up. Do we have that much carbon? Yeah, we've got 6,000 moles of carbon. We're going to use 5,000 moles of carbon. So that tells us, yes, silicon dioxide is our, is our limiting reactant. Carbon's our excess. We want to know how much excess. We just do that subtraction, right? We've got 6,520 minus 5,186 moles used. So we'll get something like 1,400, nope, got to borrow, 300 and... 30, Four. but we're going to have to round it to the, our, our uh, uncertainties in the tens place, right? So we're going to have to round it to the tens place here, but yeah, that would be our calculator answer. 1.33 times 10 to the three moles would be our rounded number. Most of the way there, right? We've done all the work to get everything in moles. I just erased the 25, 93 moles here. We know what's running out first. We know what's going to be left over of the carbon. What's our theoretical yield in terms of silicon? I think everybody can do the math in their head. So if you're thinking the math looks really simple, you're probably doing it right. Our theoretical yield is 100% yield. 
not the number I was looking for, but you are correct. One mole silicon dioxide used makes one mole of silicon as a product. I mean about the math being simple, right? Mathematically, what does that do? The units cancel out, but the numbers don't change. So that's, you know, in our food analogy, that's like saying for every one patty, you make one hamburger. How many patties can you make from 24? Or how many hamburgers can you make from 24 patties? 24. It's still worth showing sometimes because a patty is not a hamburger. So to actually show all of your work, even if it's one-to-one, -one, it's still in your best interest to do this so you remember what's happening. All right, so what is that number? It's our, it's one of those up there, right? Theoretical yield. It's 100%. We're going to compare that to our actual yield to get the percent yield. If we did every, if everything went perfectly, and it's the right type of reaction, you can get close to 100% yield for your actual measured yield at the end. But it turns out you'll never actually get 100% yield, even if you do everything right, mix everything right. It turns out most reactions, actually, you can say all reactions, stop before they get to 100% yield. They reach what's called equilibrium, where the forward reaction and the backward reaction are happening at the same rate, which makes it look like, no, there's no change happening. We'll spend more time with equilibrium next week, I think. Um, but that's why you never see, very rarely do you actually see 100% yield. And even if you do, it's probably a rounding error. It really it might actually be 99.999% yield or something else mixed in mixed in with it that's making it look like it's more sometimes even more than 100% yield. None of that applies to actually calculating a percent yield though, right? To calculate a percent yield, take what you got, divide by what you could have gotten, might have gotten. I don't know, my use of the subjunctives, rusty. So percent yield is going to be 22.35 times 10 to the 3 divided by 25.93 times 100, right? All right, so the more of these we do, the, the more second nature they should be, right? For now, it still feels like it's me up here and, and you're just kind of trying to keep up, but pretty soon you'll feel a lot more comfortable with this if you're not yet, which is why your quiz over the weekend will be some more practice, not ones that are this long. I think there's, there's one mass to mass conversion or mass to mass stoichiometry and a couple mole to mole stoichiometries on the quiz this weekend. And then on Tuesday, you'll get more practice. Again, this is one of the fundamental skills that you get out of this class. And it does apply to more than just chemistry. Um, you go into anything in the life sciences, you have to know how stoichiometry works because most things that happen in a cell are chemical reactions. Uh, anytime you work in engineering, you have to be able to do this because you have to be able to predict how much product you can make from a certain amount of, of input, even if it's not a chemical reaction, even if it's just, you know, like you're, you're working in a factory that produces motorcycles, you have to be able to calculate how many exhaust manifolds you need for this particular order. You can still represent that with conversions. Is it, it's totally specific to solar chemistry or is that the, the, the term is, yeah. But okay. the idea of using it just it's just a conversion that relates before and after yeah. is not technically stoichiometry, but it's really the same stuff.
All right. So with that in mind, let's start talking about types of reactions. Oh, we have plenty of time. So types of reactions, we're going to get into not just looking at describing it, but also sort of categorizing what type of reaction we're talking about, um, partly so we can talk about it in more um, convenient terms. So just like memorizing your nomenclature rules so that we can have a discussion without you getting lost every five seconds. If I say lead four nitrate, you know what that formula is because you know your polyatomics, right? Um, it helps to have ways of describing the reactions as well so that we don't need to write it out every single time like this. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways to classify chemical reactions. And unfortunately, there's no silver bullet sort of style of classifying them. There's no one universal way to classify chemical reactions because it depends a lot on what field you go into. Geologists have their own way of classifying chemical reactions. Biochemists have a different way than organic chemists. So it seems like organic chemists and the biochemists should be able to work together. It seems like they'd be pretty close. Turns out they almost could not be further apart in the way they describe chemical reactions. Um, so with that in mind, a lot of textbooks will have something like this where they talk about synthesis versus decomposition or single replacement versus double replacement. I don't really like these. So don't bother trying to write these down super fast. Oh, right, because well, that's good because that is one way to think about reactions. It's not a bad way to think about them. It's just not the only way. Um, if you look at other textbooks, they do it like this: precipitation reactions versus acid-base reactions versus gas evolution versus redox, including com combustion reactions. Well, these I pulled both of these figures from textbooks that are both made for this class at different schools. So even the textbooks for this specific class can't agree on what the best way is to classify these. Uh, and just to make the point, you could also further break it down into it's either addition, decomposition, or neutralization. That's an even more simplified way of looking at it. Or you could look at it in terms of organic reactions, where you have nucleophilic versus electrophilic versus radical reactions, and they can be substitution, addition, or elimination. Right? There's all these different ways of looking at it. There's there's um, biochemistry. You've got ex the uh, different classes of enzymes in biochemistry. They classify them based on what type of enzyme catalyzes the reaction. Thomas's room. All right, ready to break up the circle. All right, and so wherever whatever field you go into is going to have its own way of doing this. Um, and so I'm not going to spend so much time on this is the way you must do it. This is a way to do it. The way my mind works is I try to find the simplest possible way of separating things out, and I kind of make a flow chart. It's either this or that. Instead of having four categories, see it, Brody. Instead of having four categories, really it's just two categories. The two categories that I break it down into is either you're moving electrons or you're not. Right. And so out of all of those other types of reactions in all those different tables we were just looking at, this is still the most fundamental way of separating out chemical reactions. Either you're transferring electrons or you're not. Right. And so At its most basic, this is going to be the way we classify them. And we can add further categorizations beyond that. All right. And so the way that I describe these is it's either a redox reaction. Does anybody remember what redox stands for? So redox stands for oxidation reduction. I don't know why, but this is, you always say it in this order when you say the whole words, but then you, when you abbreviate it, you switch the order. Couldn't tell you why. 
That's just always, you never see reduction oxidation reaction. And you never see oxred. This is just the way that it, that it is commonly used. Redox means oxidation reduction. And that means that's our first option. These are transferring reaction or electrons from one nuclei to another. The other way of classifying, basically, I was this is and this is not a common term. This is the term that I've come up with. Um, I'm open to suggestions if you have better ideas. Rather than just say not redox as the other option. Basically, what's happening in the other options is kind of like you're taking Legos apart and putting them back together differently. By doing that, you don't really change the Legos, right? They're still the same Legos before and after. You just changed how they're configured. And so I call that a complexation reaction. You're changing the way they're, they're added together. Um, but you're not changing what the Legos are. A redox reaction would be like if you're taking your Legos and you're going to you're going to dissolve them in acetone and recast them into new pieces. They're totally different than what you started with. Complexation reactions, you've got all the same atoms with the same charges for the most part. They're just arranged differently. All right, and so we're going to do two examples of each of these for, for this class. Um, the two examples for complexation reactions are called precipitation reactions or acid-base reactions. Precipitation reactions and acid-base reactions, neither of those changes the charge of anything. For a precipitation reaction, that's like that example we did at the beginning where we added the salt to the, uh, to the lead nitrate. You still had lead four before and after. You still had sodium ions before and after. You still had chlorides before and after. You still had nitrates before and after. You just changed how they were arranged, how they were stuck together. And an acid-base reaction is pretty similar. We have, I'll go through examples of each of these two and how to recognize them. Um, the, and this is also far from comprehensive on the redox side. If you have a metal, if it starts as a metal and then it turns into an ion, it's no longer has the same number of electrons around it, right? It's electron configuration changed. That's a clue that it's a redox reaction. So metals participate in redox reactions and they're pretty easy to recognize when they do. Then the other most common category of, of redox reaction at this level is combustion reactions. Who remembers what a combustion reaction is? Burning stuff, right? And the products are H2O and CO2. Right? So that one's a little bit harder to see whether it's a redox reaction or not. Let me see what order. So for instance, or so let's talk about complexation reactions first. If we're looking at an acid-base reaction, we're gonna go into more definitions of acid-base reactions when we get into equilibrium. But the easiest way to recognize an acid-base reaction is, is you have everything is the same before and after, but you just moved one hydrogen ion from one molecule to a different molecule. Anytime you can see that, it's a redox reaction, or sorry, it's a um, acid-base reaction. So it might look like um, HCl plus H2O. When these two react, it turns into H3O plus, also known as, what is this polyatomic ion? I would imply it ends in exactly hydronium. Remember, I always is going to end in a or have a negative charge. So it's hydronium. And chloride. The way that we know that this is an acid-base reaction is because all that happened is the chloride lost an H plus and the water gained it, right? But everything, even though there's we have charges now over here, the oxygen still has just as many electrons around it as it did before, right? 
it's just got one extra bond in terms of formal charge. And our chloride has just as many electrons as it did before. It just has one fewer bond. So with that in mind, the only thing that really changes is this H plus shifting to the oxygen. That's the, our definition of an acid base reaction right now. Every acid base reaction can be written down like this. Right? And so have them skip forward for a second. All right. And so the way that we categorize these is whatever is giving up, whatever is losing the H plus is our acid. Whatever gains the H plus is what? Well, if you have an acid and it's an acid base reaction, this is going to be the base. The base is whatever accepts the H plus. The acid is whatever gives the H plus. So we call it, that's that's our definition. We call that the Bronsted Lowry definition. Is because it turns out there's other ways of thinking about acids and bases. Just like there's other ways of thinking about reactions, there's other ways of thinking about acids and bases as well. But this is the most common one. Is to just think about it in terms of an acid is the H plus donor and the base is the H plus acceptor. Right. So how many how many subatomic particles does an H plus have? If uh, if we're looking at the periodic table. Hydrogen normally has how many protons, neutrons, and electrons? One proton. How many neutrons? Zero. And how many electrons? One. If it's hydrogen with a plus charge, how many electrons does it have? Zero. So the other term we see for hydrogen and ion, and sometimes we just call it a proton. It's a proton basically just floating around by itself because it doesn't have any electrons around it. It doesn't have any neutrons. So even though it's technically a hydrogen nucleus, sometimes it's uh, the other way of phrasing it is just a proton donor or proton acceptor. So for this reaction that I have written here, what's the acid and what's the base? Acid and HCl. Acid is the HCl, good. So then by process of elimination, the water's got to be the base. If the reaction happened backwards, we started over here, what would the acid be? Be the H3O. That would make chloride the base, right? So we have another term for if it happened backwards. We call this the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Right, just so you've seen these terms, and again, we'll spend more time with this, but um, one of your problems on the final will be, here's a reaction. What's the acid? What's the base? What's the conjugate acid? What's the conjugate base? They're common enough terms in sciences. That's one of those things that you're going to, one of those vocab concepts that you're going to have to bring with you in your next science class. It's the idea of, of acids and bases and conjugate acids and conjugate bases. Right? So anytime you can identify the acid and the base, you can identify what's giving up an H plus and what's gaining an H plus. That's your, your foolproof way to identify. I definitely have an acid base reaction here. Or conversely, if I said um, nitric acid reacts with NH3 ammonia in an acid base reaction, we should be able to write the products out. We have nitric acid 
So nitrate would be NO3 with a minus charge, right? So nitric acid's formula would be HNO3. It reacts with ammonia, NH3, in an acid-base reaction. What's the product going to be? What's going to act as the acid? The one that we name is an acid. It's okay. That that was a tricky question. I should have uh, teed that up more because you don't really know that really all that well yet. Um, nitric acid is a strong acid. It's very good at giving away that H plus. So if nitric acid is the acid, ammonia is the base. What are we going to make? Good. An NH4 plus, which has a name as well, right? It's another one of our polyatomic ions, ammonium. So you put nitric acid and ammonia together, you get ammonium nitrate dissolved in water. along with a whole bunch of heat. All right. So acid-base reactions are going to take a little getting used to. We're going to get more pro or uh, more practice with them, um, especially as we get into equilibrium. But it's because it turns out this reaction doesn't happen 100% of the way. Some acid-base reactions, we can say they, they occur to completion within sig figs. They're more or less 100% yield. But a lot of acid-base reactions, are you only get like 5% yield. Or maybe you get 95% yield. Figuring And equilibrium is the way that we can calculate that ahead of time. We can predict what the yield should be before we actually do the experiment. And acid-base reactions are a really common way to study that because there's lots of acid-base reactions that don't occur to 100% of completion. One of the other common ways to study that is our next reaction, which is a precipitation reaction. So a precipitation reaction is really a very specific case where you just say if you mix two aqueous solutions together, and it makes a solid. That's a precipitation reaction. So you start with two solutions, mix them together, and then you get a powder in at the bottom of your solution or crystals at the bottom of your solution. That's a precipitation reaction, which means that they're actually pretty easy to recognize just by looking at the phases before and after. But they're, they're pretty much always going to be ionic compounds. Um, and they're going to start with both of them aqueous. And then on your react or on your product side, you're going to have one of them as a solid. So our reaction we looked at earlier, the lead four nitrate, aqueous plus sodium chloride, aqueous. When you mix them, you get lead four chloride as a solid and still sodium, now sodium nitrate aqueous. This isn't a redox reaction because you can still recognize everything before and after. Nothing changed what it was. None of the ions changed. The lead still have, has a plus four charge here. It's still got a plus four charge. Your chloride was a minus one. It's still a minus one. Your sodium was a plus one, it's still a plus one. Your nitrate was nitrate, it's still nitrate. All right, so the only thing that happened is we mixed these together in a way that we made a combination of ions that doesn't dissolve in water. Right, because when we put, when we have an ionic solid dissolved in water, we don't really actually have sodium chloride floating around as a molecule. We actually have sodium ions and chloride ions floating around. So you could actually rewrite this as 
sodium chloride aqueous, you could write that as sodium aqueous, sodium ions aqueous plus chloride ions aqueous. And if we added, if we did the same thing over here, we also have lead four aqueous and nitrates aqueous. So on the reactant side, we've got all four of these ions floating around together in the solution when we mix them together. Thing is not all combinations of ions dissolve equally well. Most, not most, uh, because silicon dioxide exists, but a good chunk of the minerals that you find are ionic compounds that just don't dissolve well in water. If you happen to make a com, if we mix two solutions together and we happen to make one of those combinations that doesn't dissolve, then, it then they basically just stick together and turn into a solid. That's all a precipitation reaction is. We happen to make some combination of ions that doesn't dissolve in water anymore. So they tend to be pretty easy to recognize because you're always going to start with two aqueous ionic reactants and you're always going to make one solid and then whatever else was there is still there. It's just still dissolved. So the sodium ion, so the, the chlorides and the lead ions stick together to make our lead four chloride here. The sodium ions and the, and the nitrates are just still floating around. They just stay dissolved. All right, so not much is really happening here, right? Which is why this is in this complexation reaction. There's nothing really that tricky. Everything has the same charge before and after. The acid base reactions, they look like the charge is changing a little bit because you moved an H plus around, but every individual atom still has the same charge before and after has the same electron configuration before and after. On the flip side, redox reactions are going to be anything else. Anything that you can look at it and immediately say something changed charge, something gained electrons or lost electrons, boom, redox reaction. We can get more precise about types of redox reactions, but at its core, a redox reaction is just things change charge. And that's really easy to see with when you start with uh, metals and then they react and form ions. You start with a metal and you don't end with the same metal, it was a redox reaction. Something, some electrons changed hands. Or if you start with a metal ion and you make the metal as a solid, that has to be a redox reaction as well, right? So in this case, this would be if you put zinc ions with sodium metal, the sodium will, will rust essentially, they'll oxidize to become sodium ions. And the zinc gains those electrons and goes back from, to be from zinc ion to zinc metal. Right, so metal redox reactions are pretty easy to recognize too. Anytime you've got metal on one side and it's got a charge on the other side, that's a metal redox reaction. So for instance, if I started with lead for chloride as a solid, you apply a voltage to it, you can actually get it to react to form lead metal and chlorine gas. That's a redox reaction because your chlorides changed charge and your lead changed charge. Right, so that's different than a precipitation reaction because a precipitation reaction they still kept the same charge before and after. So in our second class of 
redox reaction is a combustion reaction. That's a little bit trickier to recognize. Well, it's a little trickier to recognize why it's a redox reaction. We already said we understand, we recognize what a combustion reaction is just by, it's any time you've got some carbons and hydrogens reacting with oxygen and making CO2 and water, it's a combustion reaction. But that doesn't look like anything changed charge, right? Everything still had a full valence before and after. So how do we define redox reactions if we have covalent compounds? Basically, we kind of assign a charge to them a little bit like formal charge. We assign what's called the oxidation states. And if it's an if it's a, an ionic compound or just an ion, the oxidation state is just the charge. So the oxidation state for this top one. The sodium's oxidation state is zero on the left, and its oxidation state is one on the right-hand side. Zinc starts with an oxidation state of two and goes to an oxidation state of zero. Why is that particularly helpful? Was Well, because remember, redox stands for two different terms, right? Oxidation and reduction. Just like acid-base reactions have to have an acid and a base, redox reactions, something has to be oxidized and something has to be reduced, right? And so oxidation means what? Anybody remember this from chemistry before? You get into this at all in previous Tom's classes? Okay. Oxidation. Any, is anytime something loses electrons, it's oxidation. Which means reduction is gaining electrons. So in that top reaction, the sodium, the zinc, which reactant is being oxidized? What is, which one is losing electrons? The charge is going down for the zinc, but electrons are negative, right? So zinc goes from a zero to a plus one, it lost an electron. So that means that the sodium is being oxidized the zinc is gaining electrons, which means the charge is going down. So the charge is being reduced. Zinc is being reduced. Again, with Ben Franklin, and the words don't make sense because we mixed up positives and negatives 300 years, 400 years ago. So there's a couple ways to remember this. Um, one that I've always used is oil rig. Oil rig stands for oxidation is loss. Oxidation. I can spell. Reduction is gain. First time I've ever done that, writing it out longhand. Usually I make that mistake when I'm typing. So oil rig, the other one I've seen is Leo the lion says Gur. Leo is L-E-O, losing electrons is oxidation. And Gur is spelled G-E-R, gaining electrons is reduction. So Leo says Gur. Leo says Gur. Losing electrons is oxidation. Gaining electrons is reduction. Gur. It makes sense if you know that Leo is the Latin for lion, right? Or is it Greek? Either way. Right. Leo means lion. I won't fault. No, none of you are led into astrology, so you probably don't know that. But I don't actually know if you're into astrology or not. 
But you're taking science classes, so that was a reasonable guess. So what do we do with combustion then? How do we know if combustion is oxidation and reduction? We basically, even though they're covalent compounds, we treat them like they're ionic compounds. And basically whatever is more electronegative gets first dibs at the electrons because they're the worst at sharing. So if I'm looking at CO2, if we're drawing our Lewis dot structure, it would look like this, right? If I'm assigning oxidation states, I basically say, okay, well, ignoring that it actually is sharing the electrons, let's treat it like it's an ionic compound. What's more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? More electronegative would be closer to fluorine, right? So oxygen's more electronegative. And so basically oxygen gets first dips. So what's the charge on oxygen when it gets all the electrons it wants to get? How many electrons does it need to gain on the periodic table to be stable? Two. So we say that these oxygens have an oxidation state of minus two, because they're the most electronegative thing there. So they get first dibs at the electrons. Well, if the charge has to add up to zero, what's the oxidation state on the carbon? Plus four. Because there's two oxygens and they're each two minus. Right, so to add up to zero, the carbon has to be plus four. What about with methane, CH4? What's more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon. How many electrons does carbon need to be stable? Four. So carbon's in charge now. Carbon gets to be minus four, which means the hydrogens have to be what? They have to add up to plus four, but there's four of them. So they're plus one apiece. So when, when the methane, when the CH4 reacts to make CO2, the carbon goes from a minus four to a plus four. If your oxidation state is changing, it's a redox reaction. So did the carbon gain electrons or lose electrons in this process? It lost electrons, which means it was Lost electrons, Leo, losing electrons is oxidation. All right. You guys have had a long week. We're going to end it here. Good job on the midterms. And we'll do more practice with this. Check the quiz over the weekend. It's just going to be some stoichiometry practice. I will report the last average for the week. Probably not. You probably don't need it to be current. What am I doing? What do? I meant you in the collect collectively. You don't need the to be current. Probably. Then I will curve it. Yeah, I have a nice place to be off pushing your chair. Or, not Mr. Tommy, but Mr. Shire.